Hi, this is Maggie from Design Code Debug Repeat. Welcome to the channel. Last week, I answered a viewer question about using JSON to save and restore a character in a game with a focus on cohesion and low coupling. I introduced the JSON library in Python with a simple example, saving and restoring one object to a file. If you haven't seen that video or you aren't familiar with the JSON format or the JSON library in Python, I recommend you watch that video before this one. I'll link it here. This week, we're going to look at a more complicated example. This is a small game called Bouncing Ball Save Restore.py. And in this example, we will be saving and restoring an object that has another object as a component, and we'll be saving and restoring not only the player character, but also a group of other objects in the game. I'm going to run the game first so you can see what it looks like, and I'm going to delete the restore file from the directory before I run it. This game will look for the restore file when it starts up, and restore from the file, or create a start state if the file is missing. When I quit the game, it will save out to the restore file. Okay, so you can see when I run it, there's a bouncing ball. The player can increase or decrease the size of the ball using the arrow keys, and they can change the color of the ball by pressing the space bar. A new color is randomly generated. You can see that different colored squares are appearing along the sides of the window. There are four different kinds of squares the ball can collide with. Red and green squares are good. Those are bombs and heels, respectively. And yellow and black squares are bad. If the ball collides with a bomb or a heel, they're added to the ball's inventory. If it collides with a yellow square, the ball is shrunk to its smallest size, and the size is locked, so the player can no longer change the ball's size. If it collides with a black square, the color is changed to black and is locked, so the player can no longer change the color. If the player has a heel in their inventory, they can press the H key to heal their ability to change the ball's size and color. If the player has a bomb in their inventory, they can press the B key, and that will clear all of the squares from the sides of the game. Okay, so I'm going to let a few squares build up on the sides, and then I'm going to quit. When I quit, the ball is saved, its size, location, color, inventory, and whether its size and color are locked. The squares on the sides of the game are also saved. Now, if I run the game again, you can see that the ball's size, color, and location were restored, including the direction the ball was moving, and the squares on the sides of the window are also restored. The ball also has any bombs and heels that were in its inventory. So there are a few interesting things in this program related to the saving and restoring to and from a JSON file. So let's do a quick overview of the structure, and then we'll look specifically at how the saving works and why it meets the desired standards of being cohesive and loosely coupled. Let's start with the save file. The ball object is written out first, and within the ball, the inventory is first. The inventory is nested within the ball. So you can see inventory as a key, and then a JSON string as the value, and it has two keys, bombs and heels, each with an integer value. And you might notice that the quotes within the inventory JSON string are escaped. And that's because you can't use the same kind of quote within a string that is used to delimit the string, in this case, double quotes, unless you escape them. The Python JSON library takes care of that for us. I just didn't want you to wonder what they were. After inventory, as part of the ball's JSON, we have size, an integer, color, and that's a tuple in Python. Here it's enclosed in square brackets, dx, an integer, dy, an integer, size locked and color locked, both bools, and x and y, both integers. Remember that when we save and restore our objects, we basically turn them into dictionaries where the keys are the fields and the values are the values stored in the fields. So this is showing us a snapshot of our ball object, which is our player class in this game, at the time that we quit the game. It was at coordinates 320.405, its color was black, its size was 50, etc. And in its inventory, it had 
13 bombs and 25 heals. And then after that, one to a line are all of the boxes that were on the sides of the screen. They're kind, an integer, and their x and y coordinates, also integers. There are 19 of them. Now, there are a few interesting things in this program. One is that some of the data that we're saving and restoring isn't a simple type that can be stored in a JSON, so we have to convert it. Another is that we're saving and restoring an unknown number of objects each time the program runs. Another is that we initialize our objects one way if there's no save file, and another way if there is. Another interesting aspect is that the inventory object is part of the ball object. And finally, the way we write the initializer methods is a little different because we want to be able to save and restore. We'll look at the code now and talk about all of these things. So let's start down at game. We start by creating assets before we begin the game loop. So I have on line 337, ball squares equals restore game. And then if not ball and if not squares. So ball is the ball object, the player character, and squares is a list of the squares that are on the sides of the screen. We expect restore game to create these from the save file and return them. But if it doesn't, if not ball and if not squares, then we create a starting state, a green ball in the middle of the size range and an empty group of squares to start. At the end of the game function, once the user has quit, we have save game and we pass in ball and square group. So let's look at save game and restore game. Okay, so first, save game. Again, it takes the ball and the group of squares as parameters. We open the file and send the ball the to JSON message and write the string that it returns to the save file with a new line appended. I'm adding the new line so I can use read line to read this back from the file. The new line delimits where the ball's JSON string ends and the first square's JSON string begins. That's how I'm writing multiple objects to the file. And then in a loop for square in square group, we send two JSON to each square and write those to the file with a new line appended. That ensures that our file is composed of the ball first, followed by as many squares as we have, each separated by a new line. Now you can write a list to a JSON, so if you had multiple sets of objects in lists, you could write them as lists and then read them back in as a list. In restore game, we read the first line from the file and send it to ball from JSON. Remember from the last video that this is a factory method, one that is meant to be sent to the class. It takes a JSON string as a parameter and it returns a ball instantiated from the JSON string we pass. I then loop through the rest of the file reading the JSON lines that represent squares. Send from JSON to the square class, again a factory method, and add them to the list of squares. These are then returned. If there's an error or exception while I'm reading, I set both to none, so the game will create them from scratch. There could be an error if, first of all, the file doesn't exist, like the first time we ran the program, but also if the file writing code was modified and the file wasn't written correctly, or if a person edited the JSON file and didn't edit it correctly. We want to ensure the game can recover from that. Let's look at the square to JSON and from JSON methods. These are interesting because the square has a field, kind, which is an enum, a kind of object. Objects can't write to a JSON directly, they need to be converted. Here is the enumerated type for the square kind called square kind. I'm using this enumerated type to basically replace constants. It's a way of collecting related values together into one type. It also has additional properties, such as allowing you to iterate over the enum. So instead of having constants, bomb equals zero, heal equals one, etc., I have them collected into one data type, and I can use the names to refer to them, such as squarekind.bomb. And the values are just integers. So back to 2JSON in the square class. I'm writing the square's location, x and y, directly to the JSON string. But for kind, 
I get the value from the enum, which is the integer, and write that. So looking at from JSON, it takes the JSON string as a parameter and sends that to the load s function, which returns a Python dictionary version of the JSON string. We can then index into that using the keys that we created when we wrote it out and send the values to the square initializer. So for x and y, I'm just sending the values, but for kind, I'm converting that to square kind, the enum, before passing it in. Now let's quickly jump up to the inventory to JSON and from JSON methods. These are as straightforward as the example in the last video. This object has two fields, both integers, and it simply puts them in a dictionary with keys that are string versions of the field names when it writes them out to the JSON. But there is something interesting about from JSON. When we create an inventory object from the JSON string, notice that we're passing the parameters into the initializer as named arguments, not positional arguments. Let's look at the init method. In Python, we can have both positional and named arguments. The positional parameters come first, and these are the parameters that will be matched to the arguments passed in by position. So in the parameter list to init for square, for example, the first argument passed in will always be matched to x, the second to y, and the third to kind. But we can also have named arguments, and those are matched by name. So when you invoke a method with named arguments, you write the name equals, and then the value you want to pass in. Notice when I'm initializing the inventory, I write bombs equal, and then the value from the dictionary heels equals, and then the value from the dictionary. Those are named arguments. Using named arguments is how we can initialize either in a default state, which in the case of the inventory is an empty inventory, or a restore state. We use named arguments that have default values, bombs equals zero, heels equals zero. If the initializer is called without any arguments, these defaults are used. And if it's called with arguments, then the argument values are used. Now let's look at ball. Ball is interesting because the inventory is part of the ball, so it's part of its save state, part of its JSON string. Balls to JSON is quite long because a ball has a lot of state, including size, color, dx, dy, xy, size locked, and color locked. Now one of those, color, is an object. I'm using the pygame.color class. So I convert that to a tuple before I add it to the dictionary so it can be dumped to the JSON string. I can just do that in place with a cast or conversion, as you see here on line 206. One element of the dictionary, inventory, is a more complicated object. It's an inventory object, which we just saw. It has its own to JSON method, so we call that as the value for the key inventory. When we read that back in, we send the inventory value to the inventory method from JSON to get an inventory object back. And the ball initializer has only two positional arguments, x and y. Everything else is a named argument, meaning there are defaults we use to initialize the ball if there's no save file, and otherwise we are being passed the values or objects from reading the JSON. So we've seen three examples of data we're saving and restoring that isn't a simple type that can be stored in a JSON. The square kind enum, the ball's color field, which is of type pygame.color, and the ball's inventory field, which is an object of class inventory that has its own to JSON and from JSON methods. So two of those, the square kind and pygame.color fields, could be easily converted to a simple value. The inventory object is a JSON object itself. We've seen that we can save and restore an unknown number of objects by storing them in a list, and although I didn't save this way, they can be saved as a list in the JSON format. Finally, we saw that if we used named parameters with default values in our initializers, we can either initialize to defaults or initialize from parameters that are read in from the save file. Now finally, let's address cohesion and low coupling. Each class is responsible for saving its own data in a JSON format. 
if we change a class, for example, if we add values to inventory or store them in a different way, this will have no impact on any other class. You might try it. You could try storing the inventory values in a list instead of in two separate variables. You could then write the list to the JSON and read it back in. The only changes you'll have to make are in the inventory class itself. It will have no impact on ball or any other part of the program. That is high cohesion. The inventory class is responsible for managing its own data and low coupling. Changes to inventory do not impact other parts of the program. So I hope that this more complicated example demonstrates how to handle some of the issues you might face in creating a game that saves to a JSON format. And I hope it all makes sense. As always, the code is available in my GitHub repo with a link in the description. Please feel free to ask questions or comment on the video. Thank you for watching and as always, have fun and keep coding.